And once again, good evening, everyone. My name is John Tabor, president of Loudon Photo Club. And tonight we have a speaker with us who is an independent artist from Centerville, Virginia. She's been living in Northern Virginia since 1978. Professionally, she's been a registered physical therapist, director of personnel and administration at Social Science Consulting Firm, and president and co-founder of a personnel staffing agency. She's always looked at the world through the lens of a camera. She's been taking photographs of her family, friends, and her own gallery since her first Brownie camera. Over the past 15 years, she has gotten much more serious about landscape, nature, travel, and portrait photography. Now she's devoting herself full time to her photographic passion and constantly striving to capture that special moment in time, as well as the beauty, wonderment, feelings, and humanity that surrounds us. She's won numerous competitions and awards for her fine art photographs. She has been juried into many shows and exhibitions, and she was awarded Best Landscape and People's Choice Award at the prestigious Nature Visions Photography Exposition, now Mid Atlantic Photo Visions, and was honored with both Best of Show and Second Place at the Meadowlark Nature Photography Expo. She's also won Photographer, Photographer of the Year and numerous Prints of the Year at Northern Virginia Photographic Society, as well as many competition awards. She was featured artist in Elan Magazine, and her photograph, Blue Lagoon, was on the cover. She's also had photographs published in other local and national magazines. Tonight, speaking about seeing creatively before and after, Ms. Sandy Crum. Thank you very much. Let me do my opening, and then I go to Zoom meeting and share screen. Ah, it worked. Yes. I see your screen. Can everybody see it? Ah. Okay, so this idea came to me several years ago. Um, I am actually have been taking pictures for years and years, but never knew what an F stop was until 2003. Um, so I was really having to learn everything except for the actual art of seeing. And it was slow going learning all the technical parts of it. So the idea came to me that now that I've been doing it for a few years, it's a lot easier to go out and I don't have to think about every single thing that I'm doing. But I decided that I wanted to do a pre I wanted to figure out what steps I had to make from let's see how I progress this. Um, how many um, decisions I would have to make from the first idea of going out and shooting to actually producing an image. And John's been so nice as to put a poll together. So I'm going to ask you now, um, how many individual decisions do you think you may make in the process of producing an, angle, an image? Just check one. And we'll just give you a couple of minutes. Just click on 25, 50, 100, 500. How many individual decisions do you make? think you make? And it should tabulate it, right? Although I don't, I don't see people. Oh, I have to do it myself. Yeah, it it is tabulating on my side. Yep. And you'll be able to show the tabulation. I believe I will. So we've got about eighty-three percent, and I cannot answer. So we can never get to a hundred percent. I think, but. Everybody, another couple of seconds. All right, we'll go ahead and end the poll. Here are results. Hmm. So it looks like the highest number was 50. That was the highest percentage. People thought they did 50. All right, so you can't change your answer now, but I'm going to ask you the same question again at the end. 
I shouldn't be telling you that. So don't count my slides. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna break this up into sections. Um, I am not going to read every single one of the wordy slides. So when you're preparing for your shoot, um, these are sort of the decisions that you'll be making. Where are you going? Do you need to research the area? How will you get there? Who's going with you? What photo gear do you, will you bring? You can keep reading. I'll give you a minute. Okay, so overview of the presentation. Um, my first section is through the lens, and that will be scanning with your eyes, looking through the viewfinder, shooting in camera, setting decisions, changing the scene. And then the next section will be in the computer, making selections, being creative, going beyond Photoshop and Lightroom, and the end result. So here we go with the first section. So um, when you're going out shooting, you're using your eyes. And I am not great with the um, technical at all. I'm much better with the visual. But there's a lot that I forget. So these are things that people should be concentrating on. I, I do have to preface this by saying that in some ways this presentation is best for novices, but hopefully folks that are beyond novice will get something out of it as well. So don't forget to look forward, left, right, up, down, turn around, look for the unusual. Be aware of backgrounds, the good and distracting, look close, look far. Look out windows, see the light, look for weather, look for reflections, look for creative files like background textures, simple subjects, skies, etc. And finding pictures where you least expect it. So look forward, look left and right. Look up. This um, presentation is heavily um, images. So we won't have to do that much reading. So this was in a cave in uh, Petra, Jordan. And I just happened to look up and this was the ceiling. And I thought it was quite beautiful. We've all seen pictures like this. Look up, look down. Look down, this is from an airplane. It's, this is actually the coast of Australia. Look down. The image on the left was the one that was on the cover of Elan magazine. Pretty scene, right? But turn around. I would have totally missed that if I had not turned around. Turn around. I was looking at the sunset when I was on my balcony. And I happened to turn around and see the reflection in my door window. Look out windows. This is from the Bellagio Hotel in Vegas. Look out rainy windows. I was with my son and we were driving in the National Arboretum and we're on a gravel road. And it started pouring and my windshield wipers were going like crazy. And I sort of saw this blurry thing in front of me. So I shut my windshield wipers off and I thought it was really interesting to look at. See the light. When I first joined the camera club, one of my mentors, Ed Funk, um, I loved this image. I named it Tranquility and I showed it to him and I was a mere novice. And he goes, big deal, it's a duck swimming away. But I love the tranquility and the feeling of it. So 
I still do. See the light. This little guy is now 22 years old. Look for weather. Look for reflections. This is actually supposed to be upside down. And it's a reflection and all I did to it was darken this and make them silhouettes. Look for creative files. I have a whole, um, folder for um, background images and images that I might want to merge with other images. Look for creative files, background textures. Look for simple objects that you might be able to look use for some creative files. Skies, look for the unusual. This was in um, Argentina, Buenos Aires in, in the Boca region where and we got to see the Boca juniors play soccer. Look for the unusual. This image just cracked me up. This was from um, India. And it took me a minute when I saw it on my computer to see, let me put my thing on, annotate. to see him. I guess it's not working. That's okay. To see the guy in the image. Sorry. So these are sort of interesting. I was in Greece in Crete and I went to the archeological museum and I, for some reason, I was smoking back then. So I went out back to smoke a cigarette. And this was like in the back of the library. It was like a little junkyard. And I just sort of saw this image and it really looked like an oil painting to me, the one on the left. And I shot that one. And the one on the right was just a setup at my son's groom's dinner the night before his wedding. And I thought it was pretty. So again, um, in Greece, this was in Athens, and I actually went to a different camera, Silver Spring Camera Club, I believe, and there was a guy wearing a Bretto's t-shirt that says Bretto's, and I could not believe it because we were in a restaurant in Athens, and again, I went outside to smoke a cigarette, and I looked in down below, there was a bar, and I could see this reflection. So I went in and took a picture of the bar and uh, apparently it's quite a famous place. I had no idea. So if I hadn't gone out to have a cigarette, I would have never sat, found, found that, but I don't no longer smoke. So <laughs> um, this was when we were on a 
cruise, a uh, little river cruise. And this was in Spain. And I went to the ladies' room. And there was mirrors everywhere. And so I had my camera with me. So I took a picture of me inside the toilet area. <laughs> OK, looking through the viewfinder. Um, there's no way to really do this. We can do um, raised hands. I don't know if we'll be able to see those or not. But um, when looking through the viewfinder, you have to decide about portrait or landscape. Um, I'm doing mostly landscapes, mainly because I can usually crop them into a portrait version. And also I make calendars. And so those have to be in landscape. But I do look at it both ways. Uh, look for unusual or unique compositions. Move yourself high, low, angle, left, right. Catch the moment, wait, explore your subject. Make a series, tell a story, create mystery, have a sense of humor, play and have fun. So I normally do, when I'm in person, we raise hands. So I ask people whether they prefer the portrait or the landscape view. I don't know if you guys can raise, you really can't. If I say portrait, how many people, if you can press the button that says raise hands, I don't know if I'll see it. John, do you think that'll work? Yeah, we can try it. Yeah, we see, if you look in the gallery view, you can see hands coming up. It's in reactions. Okay, so this is for portrait. These are the hands going up for portrait. All right, how many do you see, John? I see three, whoops. Yeah, I, I'm not able to see this. One, two, three. Yeah, two, two with thumbs up and three with hands raised. Okay, how about landscape? We've Does got it look pretty even. We've got nine for those. So people like the landscape view better. Right? We're gonna do the same thing. Take your hands down. Thank you. What about this one? Left portrait. Raise your hand if you like that better. What do you see, John? I see a total of nine people respond to that. Okay, nine. Whoops. How about landscape? More portrait? Definitely uh, more for the left side. That's right. We got five voted for the right. Yeah, I did this um, image in honor of Joe Miller looking for simple, simple images. Portrait or landscape? Portrait. Ooh, a lot of people. That landscape. Like Sorry. It looked like 12 people voted for a portrait. Okay, landscape? Or seven, yeah, seven people did for that one. Okay, so what I didn't put in my bio is that this image, they actually used the image on the right, was a finalist in Outdoor Photographers Magazine, Nature's Contest or some Colors, I guess. And uh, yeah, I was thrilled. They mailed me a book. This was one, the one on the left, won um, Best Landscape in Nature's Visions. This was in Namibia. So I originally took the picture that's on the right in a landscape view, but I cropped it to make it portrait view. And I like it, I like it better as a portrait. Okay, look for unusual or unique compositions. I think this speaks for itself. 
look for unusual or unique compositions. What I actually love about this image is if you can see somehow my annotation isn't working. The little guy in the window of the middle building sitting and reading. Um, so there's something about this image that it's not like a beautiful image, but it's one of those images I think that you could look at all day long and find something. Um, like the image on the left with the cafe, it looks like a Renoir painting. And there's just, there's a bridge and there's a sign, a beer sign. Um, and you can actually see things in these windows. Anyway, I had fun with this image a lot. Move a little. I was with a group, two other photographers on a field trip to West Virginia and sunrise was happening and we stopped at this scene and I wound up going down the road. I left everybody else so that I could get the sun totally behind, behind the tree. So the image on the right um, is my final image. And this image is probably my most spiritual image. And it's hanging in the radiation oncology unit at Fair Oaks Hospital. They blew it up huge. And as you walk in, you'll see it there. And again, move, you get different perspective on things. Catch the action. This is probably the first time I ever used burst when I was in Australia. And uh, they're actually standing on their tails. Catch the action. This was the last photo trip that I took before COVID. I went to um, Molly Isaac's um, Alaska bear shoot which was amazing, these two. Catch the moment. That's my poor Shiloh. She was like my, my dad, a dog cat. The uh, fish didn't make it 24 hours. We went out that night. I put it up high, came home. Water was all over the floor. The fish was on the floor. That was the end of it. I love the drool in this picture. Catch the moment. I call this image gag me. I wish I could hear you all laughing. Catch the moment. This is my first grandchild. She's going to be 10. Catch the moment. This guy's a father now. I call this one any kid. And that's my grandson at my granddaughter's birthday party. He was bored out of his mind. Wait, so took a family trip to St. Michael's this summer and rented an Airbnb. And uh, I don't know how many pictures I took of this, but I waited till the deer were doing something that was more interesting than just random deer. This is the best I could come out with. Wait, I waited till there was something else in the scene other than the rocks. There's a bird on a rock and then the birds flying over, over it. Wait, trying to get them mostly doing something interesting. That's one of the hardest things is just to sort of wait to get what you want to get. I call this no ifs, ands, and buts. So there was, it's not a beautiful picture or anything, but I just thought it, it was humorous in that 
All you saw is the butts except for one head that turned around. Wait, it'd be interesting. Um, let me, I'm just gonna ask people a second, which one do you like better? The one with the dog standing up or the one with the dog laying down? Let's do the first with the dog standing up. Raise hands, please. Yeah, it's about seven, 15. And what about the one on the right? Laying down. Be about seven. Interesting. Really interesting. Huh. It's funny, my preference, although I really need to go back and do it. So now I can do the, um, the fog eraser. I'm sorry, I'm like having problems with my long COVID memory with words sometimes. Um, my probably yeah, my most, what? D. Hayes. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, were you thinking of D. Hayes? Yes, thank you. My D. Hayes filter on there. Um, probably this is one of three of my most sold images, and it's the one on the right um, with the dog laying down. And it is my preference because it just looks like a very serene scene um you know a lazy and it's called lazy day but it's everybody's perspective is really different so all right explore the subject iwo jima make a series make a series this is at eleanor lawrence park I did go there this fall and I cannot get that scene, either one of those top two scenes anymore. Tell a story. This was someplace in Europe where one of these mime type people were getting ready. Tell a story. If you can see the two on towards the bottom that are clearer than the rest, it looks like mama yelling at her baby. Tell a story. It's a Cambodian nun slicing garlic, I believe. Tell a story. Marrakesh um, spice store. Create a mystery. So this is actually one of my funnest images, I thought. I took this image and I also, you'll see it later in a different form. It had me wondering, who is that guy and what is he doing? Is he the shop owner? Is he waiting for his wife and he's bored to death? So it just, I like to be able to create images sometimes that create a sense of mystery and discussion. Create a mystery, is he or isn't he? Um, I think he's wearing a diaper, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Have a sense of humor. Have a sense of humor. Play, have fun. The image, the one on the left, um, Ian Plant is there on the left. This was in Namibia. The one on the right was in Eastern Easter Island. And that is one of the people from the tour on the far right with the rest of the Moai. Okay, shooting and camera setting decisions. Can you see how we're making lots and lots of decisions, you know, along the way? Um, are you going to shoot with JPEG or RAW, tripod or handheld, lens, fi lenses, filters, exposure metering, aperture, shutter speed, white balance? Although I think most of us these days are using auto white balance. 
changing the scene using macro lenses, pinhole, blah, blah. Again, here's the different changing the scenes, remove distracting backgrounds, look for elements outside the immediate frame, use props, try black light, make multiple exposures, pans, swipes, try panoramas, try infrared, shoot at night. So I did this this summer. And these are not great pictures because it was really, really far away. But there was this tree outside of our Airbnb and we were there for a week and I went out every day and looked at this tree and every day there was a different kind of bird in it. So I got a heron, I got an eagle and I got osprey all on the same branch three days in a row. So it's worth it to... Um, Return to the scene often. Use props. It's my sweet Shiloh. She loved to get dressed up. Use props. That's my almost 10-year-old granddaughter. Oh, and this is a great story. I was putting my grill cover back on my deck. And I felt something squishy. And I looked and it was this little gray tree frog. And so I ran inside. I put him on this plant that I had out there. And I ran inside, got my macro lens. And he just cooperated fully. Um, I even brought out this little toy car that I had, put him on that. And I was just shooting him for like 15 minutes. And then all of a sudden he disappeared. And he was on the lens of my camera. But he was very, very cooperative. That's my April picture on my calendar, the one on the left. Water drops. Use props. Try black light. Remove distractions. I did the best I could with this what Lightroom was back then. I could do a much better job with it right now. This took me forever back in the day look outside the immediate frame this was on the same day that i got the heart coming through the trees image in west virginia um i saw the image on the left and then i saw the deer to the right and no matter how much i tried i could not get the deer to move into my picture frame so we'll talk about that later I kept saying, please move, please move, get into my picture frame, but it, they, they weren't hearing me. Multiple exposures pre-planned. Unfortunately, I can't do this as well now because I'm using, uh, I'm not using my Nikon that I can do nine superimposed images on. I'm doing Olympus now. Multiple exposures, multiple exposures. Pans and swipes. I'm still doing those. My husband hates these. Pans. Not very good at it. Panoramas. Infrared. This is outside of Prague in Kutnahora. Shoot at night. In the computer. Huh. Making selections. Delete your obvious losers. Think about how you might use the image. That's always really um, an important element. Is it for yourself, your friends, your clients, competitions, contests, etc.? I use a five-star rating system and look for images that fulfill the purpose of the shoot. Great pics, happy accidents, creative possibilities. And if you can, delete your unrated files and, ba and always back up your images. So happy accidents. If we were there in person, I would ask you what this looks like. 
But to me, I was in a boat inside a cave in Hawaii and looked outside, shot this picture, did not see it till I saw it in the, ca in the computer. And to me, this looks like George Washington. With the nose, I don't know why I can't do that. With the nose and the eye, I wonder if anyone else can see it. So <laughs> this happened last winter and I'm waiting for some snow this year. This is from my cell phone. I was taking a picture at night outside. I think it was at night. Yeah, it looks like it was at night through my glass door. And that's how it came out on the left. Then my husband walked into the scene and he was in the reflection. It, they're not great images, but I just thought they were pretty funny and wanted to show you all. Happy accident. To me, it looks like the profile of a face with its nose looking at its hand. And can anyone see the Viking? So I didn't see this when I was shooting it. Um, so all these images, when I say happy, oh, look at that. I wonder what that is. Okay. Um, all those ones that I called happy accidents, I didn't see them till I saw them in the computer. Uh-oh, now I've done it. Okay. It's not going. There we go. Another happy accident. I'm not going to annotate anymore because it seems like it messes me up. Um, this sort of looks like a happy face. I don't know if you can see that. Okay, being creative. Black and white and selective images. Selective black and white. Crop, 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 crop. Enhance, combine montage, special effects, filters, dream glows, reverse montages filter effects, etc. cetera. Um, if you're interested in Dream Glows or Orton effects from Andre Gallant or Google Orton effects. So color to black and white, obviously, obvious. I actually think I like the black and white better on this one. Convert to black and white. Yeah, I'm not sure which one I like better on this one. She was not happy with me. I definitely like the black and white grunge effect on this one. And there I did a selective black and white um, on the guy at the store. And I think that really emphasizes it more. So this crazy image was just, um, I was on a boat in Seattle, scenic boat ride and saw this and I just loved the painterly effect of the side of the ship. And I took the image as you see it and then I cropped it and it won this, big award at some Fraser gallery or something because it's so painterly looking. 
didn't sell any of those. So this is the John Lennon Peace Wall in Prague. I doubt very seriously whether that's even still there since it's constantly getting redesigned. It's a really long wall. It's not in an obvious place, but everybody knows where it is and can tell you if you're ever there. Um, and I use this as my holiday card. You see my name on the bottom right? I put my name on, on, on the image, not on the wall. Crop. So this is really a weird story. So um, this is my backyard and at about an hour before sunset, I get the sunset in my backyard and I saw this glow at the back of the property and I got my camera, ran out there and got the picture on the left, which looks like nothing, right? Except for the lighting on it. So I was playing with Photoshop back then and I just started playing with it and I really cropped it and rotated it and did all kinds of things to it. And this image, believe it or not, won first place at the Meadowlark Nature Visions thing way back when. Um, it's not brilliant, but <laughs> it was just weird. <laughs> Combine images, um, make a montage. I made cards out of these that I send out, unfortunately, as sympathy cards. Montages. So this is probably my biggest selling image. And the top left is a wall from Greece. And top right is a villa we stayed at in Italy, but the sky was horrible, as you can see. So I combined the two, and it really does look like an oil painting. And when we were talking about the deer not being in my image, so fortunately, I had taken the deer picture and the tree picture because I did decide ahead of time that I was going to bring the deer into the picture. So I pre-visualized this scene, even though the deer wouldn't cooperate with me. And that same year that the um, crazy um, tent worm caterpillars won first place, this one won second place that year. And it was the only year they ever did a first and a second place at Meadowlark during the nature's vision. Combine images. So the image on the left is a cloudless sky. That's the original. There was a bird to the left that same day. And I pre-visualized bringing the bird into the image and I think it really, and helping the sky. And I changed the sky as well, I believe. So I thought that made a better looking image. So this is really was fun. This was like in my first year, like 2004, 2005, I was at the zoo and I took a picture of my beautiful ape there looking at his hand and I'm looking at it and it looks as though he's just looking lovingly at his hand. And it reminded me immediately of King Kong. So I had my friend Marjorie pose for me, bottom right, and I combined her instead of the grass. And I was looking, uh-oh, sorry. I was trying to move. Okay. I was trying to see different people. 
Um, I came out to my car and found a praying mantis on my car and the reflection of the sky on my car hood. This didn't come out very well. I probably should take this one out. But I just had a fun time combining this and flipping them. And um, this is with a Dream Glow or Orton effect. Dream Glow, Orton effect. Same here. That's a little much. Reverse montage. I have a very hard time pre-visualizing what would make a good reverse montage. Um, I got lucky on a few of these. Filter effects in Photoshop. Combination of different filters. Going beyond Photoshop, Lightroom, and plugins. I don't really use Corel Paint Shop Pro anymore. There's lots and lots and lots. Um, Nick HDR on one photo frame. Perfect layers. The end result, um, you're going to find files on your computers, um, CDs, etc. posting them on the web. What you're going to do with these images, slideshows, presentations, print, and then the decisions you have to make on your prints is, are you going to do it, you know, what choice of ink? Are you going to do it in matte, black, or um, photo black? What papers are you going to use? Are you going to do glossy or canvas or metallic or whatever? Um, choice of mats. What, what, what kind of mats are you going to use and what kind of frames, if you're going to frame it, are you going to use? And also the kind of glass you're going to use. I think that we just don't even think about all these decisions that we make, you know, for one image. So back to the poll. Could you do that again, please, John? How many individual decisions now do you think you make in the process of producing an image? If you could put the poll up, John, please. Results are coming in. Another few seconds for folks to reply. We've still got, got about 80% on so far. Seconds. All right, looks like we've got everybody, so we'll end the poll. Results. Aha, uh -huh. so we went, originally it was 50 um, in the beginning of the presentation. That had 48% in the beginning. Now we're up to 100 or 500. Um, so I thought it was just an interesting concept, you know, just to try to think about all the things that you do subconsciously in producing an image and breaking it down. So, um, you know, that is my presentation. Um, so 
I told John ahead of time that my presentation was probably less than an hour and it looks like it was about 45 minutes to me. 40, 45 minutes, right? Up there about. So I, if anybody is interested, I have three other quick slideshows, not presentations, um, that I would love to share with you uh, if you like. It's not a presentation per se, it's much more of a slideshow. I mean, I'll be making some comments, but not a lot. They're pretty fast. So um, depending on the timing and how bored everybody gets, um, I can do all three. I can do one, two, and three. So um, if we can just take a poll of you all about what you might want to see. Uh, my husband and I, I'll just give you a little brief thing before you poll here. Uh, my husband and I, when he retired, took a National Geographic tour around the world by private jet. Um, it's doubled in price since then. It was ridiculous then, but now it's even ridiculous, more ridiculous. Um, so these are photos. It was a bucket list trip um, of places that I would like to see, but not necessarily spend a lot of time in on most of them. So this is a slideshow from the Around the World. And then I have Australia and New Zealand. My husband and I went to Australia and New Zealand for a month. And there's also a video of me paragliding. And then um, went to Africa with my husband and then he went home and I went on a photo workshop with Ian Plant and Richard Burnaby to Namibia. And that one has amazing pictures in it. So I give you your choice. If you could um, vote for one, is there a way that they can vote for two? I did not set it up that way. Um, That's so fine. Everybody we gets to one. See, we'll we see what just, the ranking is. Is exactly so. If you guys want to vote, yeah, about seventy-five percent so far. Another few seconds. Okay, and in the poll. The results. Okay, so around the world is first, African Namibia is second, and Australian and New Zealand is third. So they didn't care that much about me paragliding. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Um, so let's do around the world by private jet, and we'll see how much time all this stuff takes. Give me a minute to load it. There we go. Okay, 24 days. Um, it was a 757 that was retrofitted to be all first class. But we never we we napped on the plane, but most of the time we were charging batteries and downloading backups and getting lectures on the plane. But we always stayed in hotels, and the hotels were like amazing. Everything was incredibly first class. So it was in 2012 to 13 over New Year's. So this was the itinerary. I'll look let you look through it. Okay. So this is the route we took. To me, the strangest thing was um, going over the international date line and losing the date. Oh, Fred is tired. Um, losing a day and never getting it back. I'm very happy to listen to you. You're lovely. And your trips are lovely and your photos are lovely. I see you yawning. 
It's okay. It's okay, sweetie. Okay, quick facts. It was 24 days, 11 countries, four continents, and more than 10 distinct cultures and civilizations, 12 World Heritage Sites, 23 plane stops and countless bus buses, 15 hotels and 24 nights, 33,000 air miles, 69 hours airborne, 68,000 gallons of fuel used, and 6,000 hot towels used on the plane, which I really was not happy about. Um, back then, my, my husband is still recovering from schlepping my camera bags and putting them up and down, up and down in the luggage hold of the, of the plane. I brought both cameras and it was my first Olympus camera. And I have to say that probably 95% of the images that I took were with the Olympus rather than with my Nikon. It just was much better for dark places. Um, I couldn't really get good images at above 800 um, with the Nikon and I could put it on auto ISO um, on the Olympus and I got a lot better. It was also a lot lighter to carry that around. But most of the time, if I could, I had one camera on each shoulder. So we first went to Peru just for an overnight and there wasn't, we didn't do very much right here in Lima. But we went to, they pronounced this sexy woman in, in Cusco. And I definitely don't do well above 8,000 feet. This is uh, National Geographic, as I said, was sponsoring this trip and they sponsor these weavers. This was on the way to Machu Picchu. Some people took the train there. We took a bus, so we got to stop in Aliantambo. Some quick facts about Machu Picchu. So we took this famous Harum Bingham train and it was New Year's Eve day. And this is Machu Picchu. I don't know if, I've not seen very many pictures of Machu Picchu on a sunny day without all those clouds. So it was New Year's Eve, which was really fun. This was the Orient Express. And then we went to Eastern Island, Easter Island. And this is, you know, so like each of these trips is just so different. And this was fascinating. And with the guides that we had were phenomenal. This was approaching it from the air. And these Moai and the mysteries behind them are, you know, Stonehenge worthy. Tongariki. I should have said, show your scale. This was just one to show scale. There's Raj. That was his name. His head in the Moai pictures. And each night we got a cultural presentation. It was a little campy, but oh well. I would really like to have taken this guy home with me. Just a cute kid. Samoa, so hot there. That was mostly a fuel stop and it was really hot. But on each of these places, we got to um, pick several different, pick from several different outings. So I went to a women's cultural center committee meeting where they do weaving and things and it was lovely australia 
was not impressed with the Great Barrier Reef when we were there. It was very murky. And definitely got claustrophobia in this submarine thing. CM Reap, fascinating. Anger Watt. We did have Annie Griffiths. Not Annie, Annie Griffith. I think it was Annie Griffith with us um, from National Geographic Photographer. So she got to take us out early in the morning before other people were there. See all the faces. Just beautiful. This is the um, jungle temple that was in Tomb Raider in part. And this was just really sad. These are floating villages. They don't have any running water or electricity. That's the store up top right. And these were the little beggar kids. Dollar, dollar, dollar. They wanted you to give them money. But the poverty was very, very sad. Yet we stayed at this hotel in India with a view from the Taj Mahal and had this purpose. We were supposed to go to Chengdu and go to the um, panda habitat, but the landing strip wasn't open. So we went to Chongqing instead. Saw a couple of pandas. And this was on the plane to Tibet. I don't know why I took this picture. I just thought it was funny. So they don't include this on the trip anymore um, to Tibet. And I actually got really sick, not only from the altitude, but I got a cold. Everybody in the plane seemed to have gotten a cold and I was really missed most of Tibet. I was laying in my bed with oxygen and feeling miserable. And now we're on the way to India. And the Taj Mahal is even more amazing in person than it is in pictures. I think if anyone were to ask me what my favorite part of this trip was, I think the experiences that I had in India were the most special, but I really don't have any desire to go back. So this was early morning. That's the hotel we stayed at. I'm sorry, this is the hotel we stayed at where you can see the Taj out the window. And there's our Where's Waldo picture. I did get a marble table top. And my husband picked a different side trip to take. I wanted to go and see the people, so we went to um, an untouchables village, which is the lowest caste of um, people. And that has really stuck with me all these years. This was on the way uh, out, shooting out the window of the bus. So here's the, the village. 
and immediately the kids came running. The National Geographic is helping, has, was, and I'm sure they have it now, getting them running water. So the kids just came r running and they were just filthy. Um, but so sweet. And this one kid followed me around. The poverty was just so sad. But as you can see, the people were very friendly. Except for her. This little girl I wanted to adopt and take home. I just thought she was so beautiful. But that guy followed me around everywhere. But he, here are the faces. There's me. And now we're back on the plane and all the stewardesses got dressed up. And the woman in the front center is actually a passenger from in India. She's a doctor. She, her husband was the extra Moai. Now we're on our way to Tanzania. It was just bizarre being in really hot weather and smelly in India during the day and landing in Tanzania at night. So what a difference. This is one of the few pic pictures that I took with my Nikon. I did not know that baby zebras were brown. That's Louise Leakey, the granddaughter of, uh, I forget his name, famous anthropologist. Then we went to Petra. This was a side trip. And that was fascinating. A hundred BC. It just blew my mind. I love the scale of this image. There's my ceiling. The guy on the left was 87 years old at the time. That guy, not not when he was 87, but he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And the woman on the right is a curator at, back then at the Nat Hat Museum in Portland, Oregon. They opened the Luxor Temple up for us and did this amazing show. And we had a big birthday party for Ned's birthday there. Fifteen hundred BC, unbelievable. So things weren't very good in Cairo back then. So we literally landed, got on a bus, went to the pyramids, got back on the bus, back to the plane. That was it. Then Marrakesh, which was our final stop.
Annabelle Nancer. Four Seasons Hotel. That's the end of that presentation. What do you think, John? Are we doing another one? <clears throat> yes, 20 minutes after eight. Um, so we, you know, like I said, we are typically booked until nine o'clock. So if everyone is up for another show, we could move on to number two. Okay. South Africa and Namibia, 2014. By the way, this image is not heavily ad edited at all. This is at sunset and the light does crazy things there. So Jerry and I flew from Dulles to Johannesburg in 18 hours and our first two weeks were in South Africa and Zambia with hubby and I have a great travel agent and the second two weeks were on the photo workshop. And I left my Nikon at home, but I had two Olympuses. I've since obviously retired my um, Nikon and I'm using, right now I'm using the OMD Mark II. South Africa, Johannesburg. We were lucky enough to be set up to do a tour with Robert Bink Robin Binkies, who wrote a book about Mandela and the apartheid spear of the nat nation. And it was, he was fascinating. And Johannesburg isn't a very safe place to be. Um, but he took us around and it was fascinating. So he funds a creche, which is like a preschool for these kids, and it's their only meal per day. So these are the poor kids in Alexandra, which is um, a very poor area in Johannesburg. And the kids were just as sweet as they could be and loving and happy to see us. And that's Robin in the back. That's Jerry and the kids just, you know, you can just see them all clamoring around. And the poverty there was just, and then we went to Livingstone, Zambia and stayed in our tented room. That's my gag me picture. An elephant safari. It's really hard to try to take unique pictures of elephants. Victoria Falls from a helicopter. Yeah, I mean, you really have to see it from a helicopter, otherwise it looks like this. And you get soaking wet. So we went to a village, again, a poor village in Zambia, and that's their water supply. Kids had fun making shadows. He's the head man. No, he's not the head man, sorry. I'll show you the head man. But you can see the flies were everywhere. That's the head man.
not a pretty picture. The mighty Zambezi River Mala Mala, which is in between Kruger and Sabi Sands. So half of that was our place. It was lovely. Two bathrooms. Went out that night. Call this Barbar. These are ox peckers. Too bad the grass was in the way. Cape Town. Didn't realize you were supposed to stand behind this, the frame. It's really beautiful there. I call this the conductor. Robin Island, that's where they had Mandela. Nelson Mandela spent 20 years there. Most of the people that were giving the tours were detainees there before. And then we went out of town to Stellenbosch and French Frank Hook. This was taken with my cell phone. And now we're off to Namibia. Probably my all time favorite photo trip mainly because everything was so different and so unique from anything I've ever taken pictures of and very diverse. And it's because of Freeman Patterson and his images from Coleman Scott and Sosa's Fly that um, I really was interested in going. So 12 days, 10 hotels, motels, lots of long travel on buses, and eight Springbok, Elon, and Oryx. There's Ian Plant. He is a hoot. So we first went to the quiver tree forest. They're not really trees, but they're a species of aloe. And this was my hut. And you went downstairs and it was quite spacious actually. And these are the quiver trees. And the guy that owns this place, um, he, these are captive cheetahs, but he brings them out in a very, very large, large area and lures them with meat.
excuse me a second. Did you say they lure the animals with meat? Yes. They, they, they let them out of the cages. And that's how we got the pictures. Okay, thank you. No, no um, judgment on my part here. I got some good pictures and I don't like to see captive animals that much, but it was a good opportunity. Then we went to Kolmenskop and it's an old deserted German mining settlement that was abandoned in the 1950s and sand has taken over. So this is sort of the village. And literally there were so many different buildings that you could go in and we only had a night and a morning there. I could have spent days there. I didn't get into every single building. This was probably, this and Sosa's Fly were the highlight of the trip for me. So no matter where you went, you would go in there and these images, I didn't, don't use my tripod that much, but I use my tripod on all of these images inside. I just found this so evocative. Crazy, huh? Come. Whenever I see this image, it's like come into the light. This is a school. And now we're going to the Sosa Fly area, which have some of the highest dunes in the world, which are composed of red sand. So here we are. It's a dune behind, shadows on the dune. And that's the, big, the red dune in the back and that's a shadow. And I didn't do anything to this image. Those are the actual colors. And there's where I got this image. Unfortunately, the tree branches are not that sharp. And you can really get a sense of scale. There's a springbok down on the bottom. I did not do this. But we had to hike two miles across this desert to get to the next area. Three quarters of a mile each way, up and over the dunes to get to the famous dead fly area, which is a large salt pan with stark looking camel thorn trees, which have been dead for centuries, some almost a thousand years old. So that's the salt pan, and those are the dunes in the back. And my close-ups of those camel thorn trees with the blue salt pan are from the five and four images, the five images on the far right, just to give you a perspective, or from this. This is before sunset. and the white salt pan turned blue. I'll never get to take pictures like this again. Then we went to Dora National Park in Walvis Bay. And they're famous for their dunes and tidal flaps and flamingos.
It's not very good. Then we went to the stinky seal colony. The sounds and the smells were quite something. There's mama and her child. Spitzkop Mountains. Atosha, which is a wildlife park. And this waterhole is this wonderful gathering place. And it's like, why can't we all get along, right? Like they, they do. Look at all these different species just getting along. Not like what's going on in Washington, DC. No comment. So here's sort of the information. The end. All right, are we doing one more or are we done? It's coming up on 20 minutes to the top of the hour. Um, you have about 20 people still in the meeting, so, uh, you want to raise oh, your hands if you want yeah, one more? show of hands if you want the last one. Then you get to see me para, paragliding. I got really nauseous, though. We got 10 so people. people. Yeah, 10, just over, yeah, about 10 people voted for yes. I don't have a vote screen, but I'm for it. Okay. I'm doing... Oh, I'll do the, the video first of me paragliding. I hope it works. Uh oh, may not. Huh. I put it. Oh, here. I'm still seeing Namibia. Beautiful, but. That's not what you wanted. Whoops, sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I was starting to feel really sick. Yes, Andy. Um it's not showing for me. I'm I'm like Fred. I, all I, what I see is the last photo. It. Yeah, I see the last photo from your Namibia. You can't see anything, huh? Yeah, you're still for my side. It looks like you're still sharing your slideshow from Namibia. Oh, okay. Same here. All right. I guess it's not working. Um. I need to get Here rid you of are. this.
We can see the slide now. You can see what? Australia, Australia and New Zealand. Okay. Well, the video somehow didn't, it showed on my screen, but not yours. So we'll just do it without me doing my flying. Okay. 2015, um, Jerry and I um, went by ourselves. Uh, Sylvia from my travel agency arranged this trip for us and it was perfect. First, we went to Dulles, from Dulles to Sydney, 24 hours through LA. First six days in Australia, second 16 days in New Zealand. And Olympuses, Australia. We mostly wanted to do New Zealand, so we didn't do a lot in New Zealand, Sydney, but it was beautiful. There's this tall building, the Eye, and I loved all these signs. So there's this rocks district and the European settlers stepped ashore there. It's the birthplace of the modern Sydney area. So there's the Sy Sydney Harbor Bridge and it's the largest but not the longest. Sydney Opera House, like the Taj Mahal, I could not get enough of it. It was just so beautiful. I'll give you a minute if you want to read. You call this the circular quay. We were treated to go inside and watch a little bit of a performance. Wow. Yeah, feel free to put your mics on. Jerry did the um, Harbor Bridge climb. I don't know if you can see people up type. We know I didn't go, no cameras were allowed up there anyway. This was across the bay. Yeah, they don't even allow iPhones or telephone or phones up there. No. Were you there? Yeah, I was there several years ago. Uh, Hi, Sydney. Yep, I was there, namesake. Um, it's a fabulous place. Beautiful. Isn't that gorgeous? Oh my God. I could not get enough of it. We went to a wildlife park in the Blue Mountains. Koalas are not bears. Cute. The Three Sisters. That's a lot of stuff to go through and we're tired the Blue Mountains, went to Adelaide. And, you know, one of the things that I do whenever I go to a foreign place is I try to hire a local photographer for at least a half a day to take me to places that I wouldn't normally get to. Um, so like in Greece, um, in Crete, I had the photographer that took me to these little alleys where I found that lazy dog image and, you know, almost everywhere I've went. So I did hire um, a guide in Adelaide, um, but it wasn't really, he wasn't really very good. But I did another one, and I'll tell you later, um, at another place, and he was phenomenal. He's the head of the camera club there, and we still stay in touch. It was only supposed to be a half a day, but he gave me a whole day because we had so much fun. So I went on my, um, my husband's not a photographer. So 
he likes wine. I don't get, really care about wine that much. People talk way too much for my taste about wine and all that kind of stuff. So he went on a wine tour and I went with this guy around Adelaide. And the main reason we went to Adelaide, I'll show you later. Oh, wow. That's a cool tree. Yeah, that's quite a tree. Buildings. is It's a jumping off place to get to Kangaroo Island. And so we took the ferry across from Adelaide Island to Kangaroo Island and flew back to Adelaide the same day. And this was really fun. So we were greeted by this kangaroo. <laughs> That's where I got them. This is sort of the sequence. I don't think anyone really won. You can't get very close to them, but they sure are cute. And then we're on our way to New Zealand. First, we went to Auckland. We had really great weather. I'm looking at these images and realizing how great the weather was. We took the ferry to Wahiki Island. Aha, uh -huh. Jerry went on the wine tour and I had a private photography tour with Bob Scott, president of the Wahiki Camera Club. That's where Jerry was doing his wine tasting. It's a Christmas tree. Apparently it only blooms around Christmas. And I was having fun with canoes, trying to make abstracts. And I really like color and texture. And fun with bottles. That's my reflection in the bottles on the bottom left. Reminded me of a boat Beatles song, Alone on a Hill. And these were the famous hip hop girls. There's Bob Scott and Friend. And we went to Kelly Tartan's Sea Life Aquarium. One of the first projects to use a conveyor belt to slowly move people through the viewing areas. They used a new form of acrylic to build 360 feet curved tunnels. Like that. Hmm. So when you're underneath it, you just like really feel surrounded. Rotorua, the global room cave. I didn't really take any pictures. Was it interesting? Yeah. Oh, I have. I didn't get any pictures in the glow room caves because I it was really impossible to do so. But Rotorua was cool. Okay. 
geysers, a mud pool, sulfur springs. She warned me that it was going to really stink because these are sulfur springs. And she said, bring a wet one and put it under your nose. I really like this image. It's a thermal village. Church. And these dancers, this is a famous dance that they do. The Maoris. They do crazy faces. Christ Church, this was after the earthquake in 2010 and 11 that destroyed many of the historic centers. There's still a lot of rubble and reconstruction going on. I didn't get that many pictures there. And then we took the um, Alpine train and I didn't get, it was really hard to get pictures from a moving plane train. And the weather was not good on this trip. It was very misty. But it was really beautiful. Punakaki, the pancake rocks. This was really interesting. I was fascinated by this tree with these little spidery looking things coming out of it. And those are the pancake rocks. Wow. Cool. Fox Glacier. So we did a hella hike. We took a helicopter up. We had found out afterwards there had been a deadly helicopter accident like a week or two before we did this. I'm glad we didn't know about it before then. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. Yeah, the ice caves were really cool. As I said, I love the signs. This was in a bathroom. <laughs> this one too. <laughs> and Fiordland. This was this was probably the most beautiful part of the trip. And we did do both of the fjords, the Milford and the Doubtful. We didn't have great weather for the Doubtful Sound, as you'll see. It's not very accessible. Most people do the Milford Sound, but we stayed actually overnight on this one. Captain Cook, sort of fascinating. He didn't enter the inlet as he was uncertain whether it was navigable under sail. And it was later named Doubtful Sound by whalers and sealers, although it is not technically a sound, but a fjord. It's so beautiful. Gorgeous. Ah, this was so beautiful. Wow. And this is one of the most top travel destinations. Richard Kipling named it the eighth wonder of the world. We had better weather for this one. Queenstown. We were there a good long time, and this was over Christmas. 
it was really, we had a lot of fun there. That's where I went paragliding. I almost went bun- bungee jumping. I mean, I've jumped out of airplanes and stuff like that, and I just always want to fly. But I didn't want to do a bungee. I didn't like the idea of that hard snap. This is hoverboarding. I'd never seen that up until this trip. This was a view from our balcony and those mountains are called the Remarkables. Skipper's cabin, we took a day trip here. And the roads were really scary. It's the road on the ledge on the left about midway. Mm-hmm. Very scary. Did you all drive? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> we, had a, we had a safari tour. Oh, it's beautiful. Look at those crazy mountains. Here's me getting ready for my power sailing or gliding. That was really cool. I'd always wanted to do this. I always wanted to jump off a cliff. There we go. So you couldn't see the video, but there's me. Crazy. And then we went back to Sydney for an overnight before our trip home. The end. Hey, look at that. Just before nine. Great timing. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Sandy? Hi, everyone. (laughs) We're back. Hey. That was terrific. Did you go through a travel agency for the New Zealand and Australia? Yeah. And... um, the South Africa part, a lot of the trips. She's, I think, like 90 something years old now, but her daughter's taken over the visit. I've never met her in person. She's in Florida. Um, John can give you my email address. And if you're interested, I can give them their number. Um, and we just have a better time sometimes doing our own trip rather than doing a scheduled tour with a company. So we were going to be in Australia and New Zealand for a month. So we didn't want to rent cars. So she arranged different parts and people picked us up and dropped us off and arranged tours. And it was a lot easier than having to do it all myself. Um, So yeah, no, she, she's been great. So I would definitely use her again. And I'm very anxious to travel again because I have not been anywhere shooting and I haven't really done much in the way of shooting at all um, for the whole COVID thing. It's pretty sad. So do we have any questions? Well, I I don't have a question, but I want to say that you're illustrating all those choices gave real context of what we go through when we try and practice our art. Say that again. I'm sorry. No, no. The the all of those questions and decisions we have to make when we practice our photographic art, they really put it in context. It's very and it it really helps re-stimulate. Thank you, Fred. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how to me it's amazing how many of those things we do automatically now without thinking. Right, but they're all micro decisions that we make all the way along. So we work hard. We work really, really hard. Thanks, Fred. Okay. 
All right. I think that's it. Um, Sandy, once again, great job. Appreciate that. And if you look through the chat, you'll see a lot of folks throwing it out there and, and giving you all the kudos because uh, it was a great, great discussion tonight. Appreciate you sharing. Uh, oh, for I everyone want to else. Read the chats. Don't shut off yet. Let me read okay. the chats. Okay. Thank you. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Okay.